right, let's make a start. Welcome everyone. This is the final of our four sessions today for our Healing the Hurt Forum. Um, welcome to those who have just joined us for the first time and to those of you who have been to the previous sessions, welcome back. Um, I'm assuming that if you keep coming back for each session, that means you're enjoying it. So it's great to have you here. Um, my name's Claire Ryan and I'm the team leader of Take Two's clinical practice development team. So I'm your host for the day. Um, and we're really excited about this opportunity to, uh, to hold this forum and uh, have some presentations from Take Two's senior people um, talking about, I guess, what, what trauma-informed practice looks like, particularly with a really complex cohort of kids. Uh, well, not that the kids are complex, but the, the experiences that they've had and the adversity that they've had throughout their lives has been incredibly complex. And that's resulted in, um, you know, a bucket load of problems and challenges for them that requires complex responses. So we're hoping that uh, these sessions are giving you some, um, some practical ideas and some reflections on how you might be able to incorporate some, I guess, trauma-informed practice in your own roles. Um, this session's being recorded, so all of the all the sessions are being recorded today, and the uh, link to the recording will be made available to participants via email after the session. Uh, the the chat thread isn't part of that recording, though, so if you're worried about what's in the chat thread, don't worry. We've set it up so that that's not part of the recording. Just be aware that the, we, while we talk about a clinical case in this session, that all the cases that we've discussed have been de-identified. So there's no breaching of privacy and any images are all stock images. They're not images of actual clients. Um, if we could just move to the next slide, please. So I do just want to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands that we're all gathered on here today. I'm down here on Bunurong country. So I'd just like to pay respect to elders past, present and emerging. Um, and I'd really like to acknowledge and um, the strength and resilience of all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And it always has been and always will be Aboriginal land. So I'd like to introduce our last final speakers for the day. Um, we have, again, for those of you who are in the last session, again, we have Dr. Alison Cox with us. And we also have Sean Barry. So Sean is a social worker and he's the clinical manager of Take Two's Northern Division. Um, and Alison is the director of Take Two, and she's an occupational therapist and a psychotherapist. Um, for those of you who are just joining, again, we really encourage you to open up the chat thread and please feel free to post questions and comments in that chat thread as we go. Um, really, um, myself and my team will keep an eye on that and either kind of interrupt and pose comments or questions to Alison and Sean as we go, or if we've got time at the end, we'll also have a bit of time there to, um, for Alison and Sean to respond to themes or questions that have arisen. Um, what else? I guess uh, just another reminder to people that because we're talking about trauma and we're talking about, uh, you know, the things that happen to kids and families that we really don't want to happen, um, that that can, that can evoke really strong feelings in you as participants. Um, so please just a reminder to look after yourselves. If you need to step away for, for a minute while the presentation's happening, then please do so. Um, yeah, just be mindful of that. Uh, I think that's all in terms of the housekeeping. So this session will finish at half past three. Um, and I'm gonna hand over now to you, Lynn, uh, sorry, Alison and Sean. Thanks, Claire. Um, th thanks everybody for coming today. Um, today we're going to talk about a treatment option of one of the programs we're having Take Two. So to set the context for this, um, as most people are aware, Take Two has many programs uh, and therefore our assessment and our treatment will vary across programs. Um, in this case, we're going to talk about a treatment option uh, that we would use in a therapeutic resident care in a rural setting. Um, to be able to do that initially, um, I thought I'd give you an outline of the case. Um, it's not an actual case, but it's very close to a lot of the typical cases that we see in residential care. Um, if people have got any questions on the way through, if they want a little bit of extra information, please uh, don't hesitate to throw a question in the chat box. Um, so the case I'm talking about today is a young girl, Simone, who entered uh, residential care um, at the age of 13. A um, bit of background on Simone. Um, Simone initially lived with her parents until she was age five. Um, due to uh, stint about 
and men of neglect and abuse of family violence. Um, and some is significant in the untreated mental illness. Um, Simone was uh, moved into a grandmother's care at the age of five. Um, Simone lived in a grandmother's care um, with her other siblings um, until roughly, roughly to the age of 10. Uh, but due to complexities in grandmother's care, um, she ended up moving into an out home care placement. Um, she was in from the ages of 10 to 13. Um, she moved across approximately 10 homes um, until she was referred to a therapy residential care at the age of 13. Sorry, Sean, can I just interrupt? Can I just ask you just to speak up a little bit? I think it's people are probably having to work a little bit hard to hear you. Thanks, Claire. Um, so, uh, so at the age of 13, she, uh, she ended therapeutic resi care. Um, some information was known about her, but there's lots of holes in relation to understanding her developmental stages, uh, etc. cetera. Um, but what we do know about Simone and Positive, Simone loves horses um, and she loves cooking. Um, and it's something that she actively gets involved in um, while she's um, in care. Um, a little bit of history on Simone's um, background. Um, so her mother and father um, are still together, um, but that relationship is quite volatile. Um, there's lots of drug use, lots of family violence. Um, there's significant mental illness in there that's untreated and there's homelessness. Um, Simone has always had and consistently has inconsistent contact with both parents um, because of the drug use and a lot of other factors going on. Um, as a result of that, Simone's got a very on-off relationship with her parents. Um, Simone has a number of siblings. Um, she's been in and out of care with the siblings. Um, currently, she's in care with one of her siblings, um, and another three siblings are in, in two other uh, care options. Um, moving from that, um, Simone's been seen by a resource. Um, go on to the next slide, Alison. Um, Simone's been in and out of services uh, for a long time. Um, so as a result of that, she's accumulated a lot of diagnoses. Um, and we'd like to really get an understanding of what other assessments have been done for children um, before we really get our picture and our assessment. Um, but while she's been in other services, as you can see, she's, she's received a number of diagnoses. Uh, one's autism, um, which, which we do see very strong significant traits that might relate to autism. Um, she's got an expressive and receptive language disorder. Um, so for her in her everyday life, um, Simone, does struggle to understand what people are saying to her, particularly if there's any complexity in it. And she also struggles to express herself through language as well. Um, that's quite a common occurrence multiple times a day and it has significantly affected how she's able to develop relationships. Um, Simone also has a so social and emotional learning disorder. Um, so she really struggles to fit and understand social environments um, and work out how she does and doesn't operate. And it quite often creates a lot of confusion for her as well. Uh, Simone also uh, shows a number of traits of what we could label as generalised anxiety um, and also post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, also, there's concerns in relation to how she presents uh, that she might also have fetal alcohol syndrome, um, mainly because of her physical representation and some of her behaviours that she exhibits. But overall as well, um, Simone's had a significant life of trauma um, right from birth. Um, now, the trauma is definitely reduced as she's gone through. However, she's never really had any stability or long-term accommodation with anybody, um, and nor has she had any rural placement that's been safe and secure. Okay, next slide. Um, a part of the assessment that would have been done on Simone, um, a big part of us to like, get a trauma lens on is we use what's called the NMT. So it's a neuro sequential understanding of Simone. Um, so it gives us an understanding of neurologically what her development's been like and gives us a picture in relation to where her function is. Um, it gives us an understanding of how she sees the world um, and also gives us a really good guide in relation to where we need to go in relation to um, developing a treatment plan for her. And we'll come back to this. Um, we use a number of uh, areas in relation to that, but we really look at four domains um, when we really want to look at from an NMT approach to understand where Simone is. Um, so if we go to the next slide, Alison, um, with Simone and with the NMT, so that we can really get an understanding from a trauma perspective, we, we'd like to look at four domains. Um, and I'll explain these domains with you, but the four domains that I'll go through are, are sensory into integration, um, because we find quite often that people, uh, children suffered from trauma have sensory issues, but also overlaps with some other diagnoses. 
Uh, Self-regulation is exceptionally common. Uh, relational, um, where they've got the ability to form and establish relationships and understand relationships, um, as well as also cognitive development. Um, when we look at Simone from these four areas, um, so if we go to the next slide, Alison, some things really stand out for Simone. Um, so within in the sensory area, what we find with Simone is she continually chases uh, sight stimulation. And without that, we find that she really struggles with the regulation. Um, so with Simone, what we find is that she really likes bright colours and she likes environments lit, um, right to the point that we put fairy lights in her room in the residential house so that it keeps that stimulation going for her. Another thing that happens for Simone is she's really sensitive to smell and enjoys smelling things. Um, this We really see this is in her cooking. Um, and cooking is an element actually that brings out the life and she really enjoys those elements of that. Um, she really gets into all the different ingredients, smells and, and, and the textures from there. And that goes into the texture element of cooking as well. She really seeks touch. Um, she, she's, very, she's very movement in nature, so she constantly moves, but at the same time, to assist her to regulate, assist her to stay in some kind of regulated fashion. Simone usually needs something in the hand or she needs something that's really having physical contact with her. Um, something that we often use with her is a weighted blanket. So it helps her stay regulated or also help her to regulate if she hasn't become too dis dysregulated. Another sensory area with Simone is that she struggled with balance um, and coordination and that also causes some issues for her. Um, so she quite often trips, she quite often runs into objects and she quite often falls over. Um, she's quite often carrying some kind of injury um, as well because of that, um, particularly as she likes jumping up and down on the trampoline, which is great for her. But on the other side of things, we find that she does have difficulty on the trampoline because of the balance. Um, another area for Simone that is quite um, impinging on her ability to cope is sensitive to noise. Um, we find that she has lots of difficulty in any kind of environment where there's probably two or more people speaking or there's lots of noise that where we've got a television going and then somebody speaking out of the telly or if she goes to an environment where there's three, four, five children all, all speaking at once. Um, the next area that we like to look at in relation for domains is self-regulation. Um, with Simone, what we find is, um, which is very similar to a lot of children that take to work with, um, she's very hyperactive. She's constantly on the move um, and she has lots of difficulties trying to regulate that. Um, she's impulsive um, and has difficulty not responding to urges. Um, so as soon as she gets an urge, she's often gone, um, often without that insight to realise that she's responding without that. Um, she, she has lots of difficulty identifying her own emotional state um, and she also has a difficulty understanding other people's emotional state um, and, she, and she often can't add up uh, either a sequence of events or something that's occurred that may have triggered her um, or may have caused a, a, an emotional outburst in somebody else. Um, what that leads to though is quite often um, people feel that her behaviour escalates really quickly and it's unpredictable. Um, so people can quite often misinterpret her behaviour as unpredictable, but when she does escalate because people aren't aware of maybe what that trigger was in that environment, uh, she'll often become aggressive and that's physical and, and verbally aggressive. Another area in relation to some fits in relation to regulation area is she really struggles with change, um, particularly changes in routine. Um, so if we set up a routine for her during the day and there's an unexpected change to that, um, Simone quickly becomes heightened um, and then has difficulty regulating um, to the point quite often we've actually got to reinstate the old routine um, if it's been changed unexpectedly. Sean, am I uh, just, next... sorry to interrupt, if, do you want to Thank just go, right. can you go back to the sensory image? We've just had a question in the chat thread that I thought was an interesting one. Um, uh, that Leanne has asked a question, is it possible that the, her sound sensitivity and her balance issues might be related given, you know, where they are located? So I'm thinking you're thinking it's a physical issue. Um, so with Simone, if we're going down that physical line in relation to say whether it's in an eardrum, et cetera, um, she's, she's actually got a paediatrician on the team. Um, so a lot of the stuff when, they, when we did the assessment with Simone, we really made sure we looked at the physical possibilities that might be causing some of these difficulties for Simone. And what we found there after a fairly decent work over with the paediatrician, um, that it, it isn't related to some kind of ear problem or balance problem or you know, ear problem. 
Um, but definitely so if in relation to some children, they definitely do have significant issues. In this case, um, it seems to be more related to a diagnosis or a number of diagnoses that have been made. Um, it's quite common in relation to a diagnosis of ASD, um, but also there is some elements in relation to as um, trauma as well. Um, so there's a real crossover in relation to what we feel that might be occurring, and that's crossing those two domains. She was also very deprived as a child. Um, so as she grew up also, she never had the option of learning those gross motor skills as well and those fine motor skills. Um, so there are deficits in just her natural development as well um, that might be coming through. Um, Simone's also a, a bigger girl for her age. Um, so, so with the quick growth, that could also cause some difficulties in relation to her coordination and how she moves. Um, relational. Um, so this is about how Simone um, interacts and forms relationships. Um, this is, Simone really works hard, and particularly where she is currently, to develop relationships. Um, she, she really enjoys spending time with the carers, but what we have seen is, is she really struggles to understand relationships, and she really struggles to understand boundaries within relationships. Um, this is, there's been quite a history of this. Um, this goes back a long way. However, if we could put a number of lenses on this in relation to whether we want to look at attachment, whether we want to look at ASD or whether we want to look at trauma, um, she's had a really mixed um, developmental line when it comes to having anybody who's been stable in a positive relationship style. Um, what we find also in relation, she, she uh, has an anxiety disorder um, and lots of traits, and that really impinges on, on how she can actually form a relationship. And then once she's in a relationship, how that happens. And again, with the attachment style that she's had, um, she's had some very rejecting and negative experiences with adults right across her life, right up to, to the current day. Um, so she's never really been able to settle in and feel safe and get a consistent feel on the relationship. Um, as a result of that very early trauma and some of that lingering stuff because her parents then had a fairly big impact on her relationship, on her placement when she was with grandmother. She, she's very hyper uh, vigilant around others um, and that still exists today. But when we look at her, I think she's now up to 15 placements. Um, so she's, she has never really been able to settle in and develop a really nurturing relationship with other ones. And what becomes really clear, particularly in a, in a current residential home, is she has very limited um, social skills and it also shows up very much in school where she really struggles to understand the complexity within relationships. And as she's turned into a teenager and the complexities within the teenage relationship have increased enormously, um, she, she's actually become even more confused. Um, so that, that often triggers quite a large amount of outbursts with her because of her, her struggle in relation to understanding that. Um, another uh, concerning factor about her is that, you know, for a variety of reasons, for her to fit, she ends up mimicking other people's behaviours. Um, and in one case, she actually mimicked um, self-harming and some quite troublesome behaviours that another young child was exhibiting. Um, so because she has difficulty reading herself and reading the impact of what she's doing on others and on herself, um, that, that causes some concerns. Cognitive. Um, so she's had an IQ assessment and she's average functioning, but what um, a speech and language assessment identifies, she had a severe receptive and expressive language disorder. Um, that's very much reinforced by the experiences the current carers have. Um, Simone has lots of difficulty expressing um, what she's thinking. She's definitely around emotions. She has lots of difficulty connecting um, some kind of internal body feeling or some kind of behavior she's just exhibited to, um, to language and being able to say to somebody how she's feeling or what she's thinking. Um, and she also has lots of difficulty understanding complexity in relation to language. So um, with her, we find that it's got to be a short, sharp sentence, um, quite black and white in nature. Um, if there's any kind of multiple tasks given at once, or there's any grayness in relation to the direction or the description or what's been asked of her, um, we find she gets confused and that, that quickly causes um, some anxiety for her and some other stuff inside, and we find that she escalates pretty quickly. Um, plus, she then, she then loses that ability to be able to communicate, which is a real shame. Um, as I've already said, she has lots of difficulty expressing these emotions. What's happening for her now? You're right, Alison, we'll go to the next one. Um, is that recently um, we've had some increased concerns with her. 
um, with, uh, she, she started medication for her anxiety. And about a week after starting medication, uh, we saw the presentation of some seizures or pseudo seizures. Um, these pseudo seizures commenced initially once a day. They were running around about 12 or 15 minutes and they looked like a genuine seizure. Um, and then over a period, they changed to uh, probably between seven and 12 a day. And the seizures were lasting around seven to 10 minutes each. Um, they were very concerning um, because what she was able to recall, what people observed while she was having the seizures, she, she appeared to be having flashbacks um, and they were suggestive of past sexual assaults. Um, and it was really traumatic for her, obviously, um, but also in the environment because during the seizures she dropped to the ground and very unpredictably, that happened in any kind of environment, um, people were exceptionally worried because it wasn't seen to be a trigger for the seizures to occur. Um, now, this is where we start into, into linking between uh, mental health and then assessing it from a mental health point, um, as well as assessing trauma and other parts, you know. Um, unfortunately, in this case, um, Simone's a victim of this overworked, overwhelmed uh, mental health system that we currently got. Um, and at that point, we tried to get her into CAMS for a review. Um, for the best efforts of CAM, but other than the fact we're totally overwhelmed, we were unable to get her to do that. Um, so we had some difficulties initially trying to work out what was maybe causing the seizures, whether there was medication or whether there was some circumstances change. Um, but luckily we were also able to get, um, get a consult with a psychiatrist, um, which is part of the Take Two team, which is Sandra, um, as well as um, a paediatrician on board. Um, so then what we did is we literally then got an understanding from a psychiatric view, a paediatric view, um, as well as take to feel in relation to what we were going to do and how we might be able to develop the treatment plan for this young girl. With that, I'll hand over to Alice. Thanks, Sean. Thanks for your very thorough introduction of us to Simone. Can I just quickly interject? There was just a question from Samantha in the chat thread. Um, was Simone at this time on ADHD medication or was it just the SSRI or the anti-anxiety? Uh, just SSRI. But a, a great question. Um, and one of the ones we always need to remember to ask about what is the full complement. Um, unfortunately, uh, often when we meet kids for the first time, we'll find out that they have sometimes been on lots of different medications. And sometimes because of the transient lives that, that um, they end up leading, sometimes there can be um, less engagement with medical professionals to review that. So um, it is a really important factor for us to uh, be curious about. Uh, for those of you that were in the session this morning, um, or, or just to um, let you know, for those of you that weren't, um, Dr. Radovini used a, um, an analogy of a Rubik's cube to demonstrate complexity and um, the multiple and sometimes competing lenses that many professionals might bring to a particular uh, problem or, or presentation of a young person. So you can, as you remember from the Rubik's cube, and there's one there on the screen, um, you can look at one side of, of it, but not see what's happening on the other side. And that you can move some of those um, cubes and in fact, change things on the other side that you can't even see. And um, I think Sean in his work with Simone was clearly starting to have some hypotheses here that um, the medication that um, Simone was prescribed to deal with one issue um, may well have worked well with that issue, but may have caused some other issues um, that were unexpected and unintentional. So so it's a good example of how we all might think we're looking at the problem, and in this case, the anxiety that um, Simone was experiencing, but we can't actually look at the anxiety without looking at everything else. Otherwise, we run the risk of um, the kind of scenario that ended up happening for Simone. Um, we know that children, young people and families are best serviced by professionals working together. Um, with everyone to achieve a shared understanding of the various factors contributing to the current situation. Uh, and in Simone's situation, clearly so complex and so much going on for her. Um, and this might require lots and lots of conversations with reviews. Um, some of those conversations might be really straightforward and some of them might be a bit trickier. Um, but I think the most important thing is that we keep trying to have conversations with all of the people involved um, with a young person um, and where there's a gap in expertise that we try and bring someone in to help us with that. 
and again, Sean talked about um, uh, trying to link in with, with um, people with more expertise around mental health presentation uh, in Simone's situation. And so that can feel quite time consuming. And sometimes, you know, we can all get um, closed doors or, or doors that are too overwhelmed for people to open. Um, and it can feel sometimes like a waste of time or that other people in the service system aren't being helpful. Uh, but unfortunately, we do know that everyone is probably under-resourced um, and that it all means that for all of us, there's various gatekeeping approaches that happen to try and manage demand. Um, and it can, feel it can feel even worse when there's a lot of anxiety regarding a young person or family situation. And it was in that scenario that I first became aware of Simone. Um, Sean uh, brought the scenario to me in, in supervision and um, his you know, uh, concerns that he had for Simone and the struggles around trying to get um, kind of coordinated care for her. Uh, and so again, that was where we used that opportunity to have a think um, about ways that we might be able to uh, bring some other professionals in to work um, together um, on trying to understand what was happening for Simone. Um, and so whilst it is challenging when people aren't available or there is different views, I, I, I think we would be wanting to continue to advocate to not give up and to keep trying um, to see if we can achieve that shared view between multiple professionals. Um, because if we don't do that, then the family or young person or the, the residential care um, location in this scenario will experience multiple explanations, and multiple plans, and sometimes they'll be in conflict with each other. Uh, and so it, I, I think it's um, the responsibility for all of us of trying to work together to get that shared view. It'll help families and young people like Simone to feel more confident about the plan um, if they've been able to contribute to it and they've felt listened to, understood, and that it makes sense to them ultimately about what the hypothesis is. It also increases the likelihood that people are gonna to stick to the plan um, and give it a go. And with all of our scared resources, scarce resources, not scared, though they might be scared at the time, um, all pulling together, then again, we're more likely to get a, a, an agreed outcome um, for the young person. Another dilemma that Simone, I think, illustrates quite well for us is um, which service is the right service? So we've got a, a young girl here who's experiencing multiple difficulties. She's got developmental disorders. She's experienced significant trauma. She's um, been given mental health diagnoses, speech and language diagnoses. Um, and uh, her situation in the residential care unit that she's um, in at the moment is really struggling to look up to meet her needs and look after her. Uh, the other kids in the unit are getting a bit scared because of these sudden um, unexplained seizures that are happening. Staff are feeling out of their depth. And so often this question will come up, is she in the right, is she in the best service to meet her needs? So, um, Again, we would try and create the reflective space to think about that um, rather than necessarily just reacting and moving her yet again. We know Simone's had the experience now of um, 12, 15 different homes that she's lived with. Um, each one I'm sure she hoped would be her last, um, but then she gets moved on again. We know each move means further dislocation, further experience of rejection, even if unintentional, and her having to start again with making new relationships. So the more we can try and maintain the current placement, if it's a safe place, then I think it's worthwhile putting in some effort there um, and to address the particular issues that are coming up in that particular placement. We know she was very distressed. She was seeking help, but her distress, though real and significant, didn't unfortunately meet the criteria to access after hours mental health services. We know she didn't meet the diagnostic criteria to access outpatient mental health services because those services are so overstretched. Though I am hopeful just quietly with the Royal Commission recommendations, there might be light there in the coming years. She also doesn't have the type of home life that lends itself to attending scheduled outpatient appointments with the local area mental health service being some distance away in the rural Victoria area that she lived in with no public transport options available. 
She'd experienced significant rejections, as I've already said, with each compounding her experience of adults as untrustworthy and unable or unwilling to meet her needs, thus contributing to her concept, self-concept of being unlovable and unwanted. That also then uh, impacts the way that she approaches services as well. Um, and often she preempts being rejected by rejecting the people trying to help her, uh, kind of keeping her trapped in a bit of a cycle. But what we know she does need is someone to help um, assist the staff that she's living with to provide a predictable and safe environment to understand the various factors contributing to her presentation and to consider the ways to engage her in regulating and strength-based positive activities. So it might not be one service that meets her needs, but there might be a number of services that work together. Another service might be one that helps to, to think about and advise on the appropriate treatments, such as medication to assist Simone in achieving equilibrium, which will enable her to then to be able to access other supports. She also needs someone to help monitor her complex medical presentation. And by all of the professionals with these different lenses and areas of, areas of expertise working together, we can aim to get that shared understanding and the shared plan with Simone experiencing, feeling heard, listened to, and increasing her sense of safety and engagement with those adults. We do know, given her experiences to date, that she is likely to have long-term mental health issues, given the extent of her experiences of abuse, neglect, and all of these disruptions. Thus, it's important for, the, for her and the care team in their planning and their goal setting to be realistic and to have achievable goals that her and the, and the care team can meet. Um, and uh, there was a, a, you know, some more detail there around the um, specifics of what we did in our interventions with um, Simone and Sean's gonna share a little bit more about those with you now. Hey, was there any questions that people wanted me to or Alison to answer before we move on? That's right. Um, so I guess, um, as you can see, she's quite a complex young lady living in quite a complex environment. Um, and Resi Care, whichever Resi Care with the best intentions of anybody, <laughs> it's always a complex environment. So from our point, in particularly take two's point, it's not about us waiting for her to be in the right environment for therapy. It's about us finding a starting point in the environment that she's in. Um, and it's about looking at where we're going to get traction and where that starts um, to start making sure that this young girl and the approach that we take is about a development approach. Um, it's not about trying to stop the unwanted behaviours. Um, with the expectation, what we do is we, we want to look at what outcomes we expected to achieve by what approach we do. And then we want to make sure we know where the responsibilities are on who in relation to achieve those outcomes. But most importantly, with this scenario and wherever we can, we really want to make sure Simone's a part of the treatment and the treatment plan. Um, she's got to feel like she's got some control over it and she knows what, what the focus is in relation to the areas it's helping for her to understand. So what did we actually do? Um, so first thing what we did is we did our assessment um, and then we took back our assessment back to the, the care team. Um, so the care team was quite wide. So we had a paediatrician, child psychiatrist, speech pathologist who was on the consult, take two. Um, we had teachers involved raising case management. With that, what we want to do is we want to look at the symptomology that, we're, that she's got and then look at it from a developmental phase. Um, we don't want to look at it in relation to maintaining or just protecting her. We want to look at what do we need to do to try and develop Simone and have a continual and the best line development as we can. Um, quite often in the residential care centres, what we find is the best place for us to start with is the staff. Uh, make sure the staff have a really good understanding of what we think is happening for Simone at this current time, um, and then have a chat to them about what we think we could develop and where this could go. Um, so there's lots of discussion in relation to with the residential staff, um, as well as the teacher involved, and that went across the care team. Um, from that point, it was pretty united in relation to the care team that we would start with trying to get some stabilisation in the resi environment. Um, try and get the environment so it meets those primary needs, which your children would need. So we try and get it so it's predictable, it's consistent, it's safe and it's nurturing in nature. Um, and so we, we did a multi, 
from the approach in relation to that. And we just rolled this out slowly. So we didn't come in all at once because what we find is if we come into a res environment with a huge amount of changes at once, um, we find it becomes overwhelming for them. It becomes overwhelming for Samoa, but there also is other children in this environment as well. So we've got to make sure that we've really got to um, fine tune what we do. So it fits the environment, fits the staff, but also um, has a positive impact on the other children in res as well. So one of the first things we did is we really looked at what mix and what was possibly the mix, best mix we could get across the resi houses um, that this agency was involved in to try and get the best mix for Simone and the other children. Whether we looked at developmental stages, we looked, we looked at diagnosis, we looked at ages, et cetera, just to try and, now there's never a perfect mix, mix but we did our best to try and get that sorted. And from that point, what we did is we wanted to look at how we could work with the carers to get a consistency in their relationship. Um, as we know, in most of these environments, in most cases, in most care situations, the relationship that the child has with the person who is providing the care is exceptionally important. Uh, for Simone, we know because she has deficits in her social skills and understanding social situations, um, and then she's got this um, view of relationships that they will be um, aggressive an adult will be aggressive towards her, is not protective. We need to look at a, a style of engaging with Simone that everybody could do um, that was beneficial. So in this case, and if you're in the last session um, with Lynn, um, we um, did some training with the staff from the PACE model. Um, so PACE, again, is the Dan Hughes model if people weren't in the last lesson. And PACE is a brilliant model. It's non-confrontational, it's very nurturing, it's very engaging. Um, and it's very accepting uh, for children. So what we did in this case and what else also we've done is we literally had to take two clinicians, walk along, do the coaching, walk alongside, come back, do the debriefing, do the reflecting and then go again. Uh, the take two clinician is a very active role, particularly in this resi house um, in relation to helping the staff develop the skills to use pace and engagement, but also come back and reflect on that um, and then work again. Um, what else we did in the house was we looked at the routine um, because of the number of different diagnoses, even including trauma, what we find with the anxiety, with the ASD, with the trauma and with some of the developmental difficulties she's got, an environment that's consistent and, um, and predictable is really often one of the very um, proactive stances you can take to try and, and keep their levels of regulation down as far as possible. Um, so what we did is, is take two users a tool called Tile and Grout. Um, it's, a, it's a great visual tool, you can use it in a whole different ways, but we use that tool in the house. So it's, a, it's about Simone's um, interest, but it's about what she likes, what she likes doing, but it's very predictable. It's visual, it's stepped out during the day. Not only is it predictable for Simone, but when staff come on and there's a change in shift or staff or staff member, the time route really um, spells out what role they'll take, even right down to breakfasts. So, um, an important thing for Samoa and other kids in residential care is it's really important that their day starts the same way and it ends the same day way. Um, so with the tile and ground in this case, we'll able to say, what, what's breakfast look like? What does it look like for Simone every day? What does that look like when she walks out? And what role does staff do? Where are the staff? What role do they play with that? So she starts that day on a very predictable note, but also on a very nurturing note. Uh, the tile and ground will set up for all areas of the day. Um, so that so her day is very predictable from the time um, the night before to the time she gets up and the toll and grab often ran for a week or longer. What we find too with her is that, I mean, other kids, is that if we're going to make a change in those structures, what we do is we're really early in relation to, to forewarning any changes in her structures and forewarning that with staff. Um, so say she was expected to go to school on Tuesday, but for some reason she had a doctor's appointment, we would start warning her over the weekend. Um, and if need be, we will walk through the process that we need to go through with Simone so we can reduce the anxieties that that creates. Um, and we'll take extra steps, and as many steps as we need to do that. So if it's an unknown doctor, we might show a picture of the doctor, we might show a picture of the doctor's office. Um, if we're lucky enough, the doctor might be able to have a conversation over the phone first. Um, we might be in a drive past the doctor's office. So we can try and address many of those elements of anxiety that we can with her. Um, so when it comes to the day of her having to go to the doctor, that's different to a normal routine, um, we're able to try and desensitise her to that change, but have it as predictable as possible. 
Um, the other thing that we find with Simone, because of some of the cognitive deficits, which could be just because of the neglect as she got older, she really struggles with developing any kind of goals in the day and trying to get that motivation going with her. Um, so Simone has a daily goal, um, and it's about a, an interest that Simone has, and it's often an interest that Simone will identify that she wants to do. Um, a great goal for Simone is cooking. Um, so, you know, the goal might be to cook um, some scones in the afternoon. So, you know, work towards that, work towards the process of that. But it gives her a reason to stay engaged and, and stay on ground, but also feel like that environment's getting constructed to meet her needs in her own way and how she sees that. Um, the other thing what we set up in that environment um, is also look at the sensory stuff. So as we know, she's got the sensory elements in relation to where she really struggles. Um, so we've set the environment up in relation to light and touch um, and noise, et cetera, so that that can cater for her, caters for her needs. You know? And so that way we can try and set it up so it's very proactive in relation to do these triggers that end up in behaviours that people say it's unpredictable. Well, we know that predictable. we've just got to make sure we set the environment up so that that's, she's able to function. Uh, so some of that stuff does include like fairy lights in the bedroom, includes um, weight blankets sitting in the lounge room, it includes fidget toys that she can pick up and play with. Um, but also to keep a response to the system um, regulated, we've also set up a trampoline in that environment. Um, the repetitiveness in relation to the trampoline is, is a great tool for Simone to keep her regulation down or, or to reduce it at times. Um, and it's a, it's a very rhythmic um, activity um, that she finds very relaxing and soothing um, and that often sets her up very good for the next interaction she does. Now, as Simone works across a couple of environments um, at the moment, so we're looking at uh, integrating it back into mainstream school, and we want to transition what we've got going in the home into the school environment. Um, what makes it a little bit um, harder for Simone is Simone's working across two school environments. Uh, so she's in alternative, alternative education environment, as well as transitioning into a main education environment. So we literally laid that same lens back over the school environments to look at what we can do to cater. Again, what we try and very much to do is we use very similar, similar symbols or setups or structures in relation to day planning, and where we can, we use very similar pictures and diagrams. Um, we do a lot of the pre-teaching in relation to make sure that she knows what's going to happen, knows what she needs to do, and we also can do a lot of forewarning stuff. Um, but in the school environment, what we do is we really make sure, because Simone's had such an interrupted education, um, that we've got a modified school program for her. Um, so we know she's got particular strengths in a particular program in different elements of the school, um, such as maths. Um, so what her, her introduction to school, and particularly into the main school, is constructed around her strengths and constructed around social situations that she'll fit in. Um, we know if we drop her into, say, a physical education class, which is often feeling like it's chaos, you've got too much noise, too much stuff going everywhere, um, we're just going to set her up to fail and, you know, to get her back into education would become an almost possible feat. Um, so really proactive. And when I talk we, it's not me, it's the clinicians that have done all the work. It's about doing that proactive stuff to get her engaged in school again. So it was about, again, meeting the teacher, looking at the uh, subjects, setting up an individual program, um, doing some kind of communication with the teacher online, and then doing a plan entry into the school, then a plan entry out. Um, particularly want to enter in there and enter out so that period of time she was in there was successful um, and can be reflected back upon as a, as a successful and enjoyable part. In the alternative school setting, there's lots of background work, like lots in relation to building her up academically, building up her skills and identifying her strengths. And that was transitioned in relation to the work she was doing there across to the mainstream school. So there's a seamless flow in relation to what she was doing in the alternative school and to the mainstream school. The other thing what we did is we built an individual learning plan and that learning plan went across both schools as well. Um, so we know exactly what reading, reading level she's at. We know what part, what subject she's really good at. And then we, we set subject levels um, at, the, at, at her ability um, and aim for development in those. And there was, in, there was consistency with the ability across the two schools. Um, we went right down to seating situations, seating arrangements, um, and, and Simone had an input into this in relation to what did the seating arrangements look like in the school? 
Um, as we know, schools are very different in, across environments. We've got open plan, we've got closed classrooms, we have seating arrangements, sitting around in six, we've got them in the lines. Um, so in this case, what we found is the best situation uh, for Simone was sit towards the front of the class, um, literally close to the teacher. Um, so she was able to hear the teacher the best, but then the teacher was able to identify and the aide was able to identify what's happening for her, but she wasn't getting lost in the, in the noise and the confusion of class, what's happening behind her. Um, we looked at um, tools as well in relation to headphones um, to try and cater for the sensory stuff as well in both schools. Um, headphones that were able to quieten things down or, or use white noise. Uh, we looked at different alternative learning options such as iPads, etc., so that we know if there's deficits in a writing, she can actually use an iPad, but then it's easier for her to do stuff at her own level. That way we're, we're working with that confidence element as well and that development element. Um, and with Simone, a significant issue is that her, she really struggles in the social arrangement. So then we started orchestrating um, kinds of interaction with other children, um, in one on one situations, and pair in relation to likes and doings. Uh, but most important, what we did is we tried to make as much repetition across the home environment, the school environment as possible. Um, there's levels of depth you can keep going to, but on the surface, you know, that's some of the main stuff we did in relation to trying to make sure that both environments mirrored each other to a degree, but they operated similarly as well. Um, the other stuff that we did in both environments is really important, and, and this come out of the speech um, assessment and consults, is because of the deficits in communication, we really wanted to make sure that we were communicating right with her and across environments. So we, support, we set up kinds of some coaching and some templates in relation to what we did with Simone. Um, so the idea is where possible we use visual aids um, because we know the retention in relation to auditory information plus some difficulty understanding and expressing it. Um, the templates in relation to tools of communication, templates in relation to what a day looks like, what's happening next, et cetera, uh, are very much used. Um, really look at reframing language. Um, even though she looks very old, um, the language we really pulled back, so it was quite basic in language. Um, and that, you know, it was probably back to a developmental stage of seven or eight, so there wasn't complexity in it. Um, but, we, but we also made sure when we communicated with Simone, it's short sentences, that we weren't given multiple instructions at once. And then we'll give her that time to process that sentence. So we give her direction to do something. We've, we give, there's a pause there, so she's got a chance to think about what was just said and then possibly ask a question before the next one occurs. Um, and then it's about being quite uh, direct and li li uh, literal with her as well. So try not to use any brainness in your language, uh, stray away from phrases and jokes, etc. cetera. Um, so that, that we minimize the chance of confusion in relation to the language that we use. Now, on top of that, um, what we also, because we want to take a developmental approach with her, is, is we started to work with her in relation to helping her to understand her emotions um, in both environments. Um, it's pretty clear that she, she is not able to articulate it through language. Um, so a system that we brought into place was use of emojis. Um, I think there were six feelings that were identified and emojis were attached to those feelings. And those emojis were used when appropriately, so we didn't want to use them when she was escalated, but the emojis were used as a part of discussion in relation to, I want up a happy emoji, you look happy. You know, this is what your body's telling me, or this is what you've done that makes me think that you're happy. And then vice versa in relation to back to the carers. And bring that in at a very low level, um, but do it on a perspective that we expect development here. Um, we're not speaking of this, um, that Simone's capped out in relation to her ability to understand herself or others, but go back to a point where we can actually get traction in development. Um, and the idea of using the symbols, and um, there's lots of different tools that we use, but this was used in a, in a, a lot traffic light scenario, um, so, so green, amber, and red, um, in relation to um, motions that fit those, and then that'll get pulled on in relation to as she develops inside, um, as she connects that with the body reactions and thoughts, then there'd be some connection in relation to inside the mothers and then strategies and management options. Sean, can um, I just butt in? Um, no, we are getting close to the end of the session. I, there was a question a little while back that I think probably sits fairly well here um, because, you, you know, the amount of stuff that was done with Simone and the amount of sort of intensive input is quite, it's pretty considerable. Um, and the question came from someone saying, do you find that there are times 
when actually having a really big care team and having so many services involved actually becomes too overwhelming, both for the client and for the professionals, where there's actually too much information and too many different, I don't know, ideas or, yeah, yeah. directions. Yeah, I'd probably say that in two ways. I think there is a time when it does get too big. Um, however, I think if people are able to have clarity in relation to their roles in the care team, um, I think that can be quite beneficial as well. Um, my thoughts are is when, when there's uh, a lack of clarity in relation to roles and there's role crossover and then there's differences in how people are executing those roles, I think that can become confusing, confusing across the care team and for Simone. But there's role clarity. Um, I think in some ways it probably doesn't have a significant impact. Um, in this case, if we have a look at the uh, psychiatrist, the paediatrician and take two, um, they've all got the ability to do some kind of therapeutic intervention, or more than ability, should I say. However, they were delineated into very clear roles. Um, so the paediatrician is taking over the medication and the medical side, but with input in relation to the therapeutic side, um, we've got the uh, psychiatrist who's got this beautiful overall picture and governance view of it, um, which, which in many ways are able to bring the many views together. And then we've got the take two that, that takes the responsibility of the execution of the therapeutic input into the, the resi environment. Um, so, yeah, I think it can become complicated, but I think if people work out the roles and then spend that time really to understand each other's perspective, and come to a more united view and approach, um, I think that would be quite often worthwhile. Well. Is there any other questions, Claire? Um, one thing I'll keep saying, sorry, I just saw Alison come off, I'll let Alison go. I just noticed Claire was yes, still I was on talking mute. with <laughs> my mute on. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think you've actually, you've kind of answered some of people's comments or questions as you've gone through anyway, actually, just in what you've said. I was wondering, Sean, what was the most challenging part of the work with Simone? Um, I guess the challenging part was to get away from trying to label a behaviour as falling into one of the hats. Um, and so... Um, very much like the Zen diagram we spoke about earlier, was to recognise that between the many hats that we could use in relation to understanding what was happening for her. So we've had mental health hat, we've had developmental hat, we've had a cognitive hat, we've had a trauma hat. To come to the centre and go, okay, so where's a, where can we start with this intervention that's going to address the needs of the majority, if not all the concerns from the multiple different perspectives of what might be happening for her. Um, and that was, a, and, and the team come to it quite quickly, actually, but it was about, okay, so if we say that there's a significant element of anxiety may be causing this, if we use this form of treatment, is this treatment going to help with anxiety, help going to help with the trauma, but also be a developmental one that's going to help with the, the uh, trauma as well in relation to development perspective. Um, the other, probably a challenging point that not only in this case and other cases is I feel it's really important that when you do a treatment plan, the treatment's about focus on development. Um, it's not a treatment plan that's about stopping or preventing the unwanted behaviours. And I guess the, in this case, one of the challenges was is to get people when they looked at behaviour, looked at an unwanted wanted, behaviour, not to go you need to help me stop her from being aggressive. It's, okay, so give me an understanding of why she might be doing that and what's the need that uh, that behaviour is meeting and then identify where does that sit in relation to whose responsibility is that to set up the first stage of intervention to meet her need. Um, an example is in relation to, if we look at the ASD element, it's quite easily to say that she needed to change to suit the environment but if we look at the ASD element and the trauma element, we know that we've got to change the environment first to get an environment that she can function in before we start putting pressure on her to change. And that's change in a positive way. Yeah. So, Sean, you've talked about um, Simone living in a residential care environment. And for those people in the audience who aren't so familiar, what that um, means for Simone is that she shares a house with three other people. Um, teenagers usually and there's a rostered staff group 
Um, so that's a, it's not just one carer that you're trying to get on board there, Sean. It's sometimes maybe 10 mm -hmm. carers. Yep, plus casuals, yeah. Um, so that's quite complex as well in terms of how to get the alignment, mm -hmm. I imagine. Yeah, and the clinician involved in this job did an absolute brilliant job of understanding where each of those, or still understanding where each of those carers are at, um, understanding where they are in relation to understanding some money, but also understanding their strength, strengths and their ability to put stuff in place that we know need to be in place. Um, it's, it's, a, it's almost an exhausting work for, for a clinician working in a resi environment because they've, they've, they're not working, like you say, with one um, carer. They're working with, in this case, I think it's up to 10 to 12 different carers. Mm -hmm. um, so it is about lots of work to bring them together as a unit and be as consistent as possible as a unit mm -hmm. um, most of the time. And if we can achieve most of the time, I think we've done really well. Mm. And I was wondering where Simone's at now. So Simone, um, so with that now, we've seen a, a significant um, reduction in relation to the pseudo seizures. Um, so they've gone, I think we're down to one or two a week. Um, but on the promising side of that, we're starting to see her develop some really good relationship with some of the carers. Um, so of course, we've got some uh, movement to do in relation to the boundaries that she has with carers. But we're seeing that initial stages of, of a really positive relationship starting. Um, we're seeing um, an improvement and a greater engagement in education. Um, and we're starting to get her connected with some social networks as well. Um, she's now willing to and actively engaged with staff to talk about her feelings and get a greater understanding of that. Um, and she's in a position now to be able to reflect upon um, behaviours that was, were happening and possibly you know, what was occurring for her. Um, she's got some way to go, but she's really at that initial stages now where we're starting to see her develop those, you know, those really healthy, positive relationships with adults and starting to see those developmental areas in relation to her understanding herself um, and bringing in that into which help, which, which then assists her to self-regulate and then actually feel really positive about having that control of herself and being able to self-regulate. must be very satisfying after all of that you know the the anxiety at the beginning and the all of the worry um and then all of the work to see that it's starting to pay off yeah and and, and for the clinician working in this race it's, it's an absolutely um very gratifying for them to see not only Simone grow but also see the resi staff grow as well um, and then see their growth in relation to understanding Simone but but working out how to interact with Simone on that nurturing, supportive, and, and that consistent, repetitive basis. So there's lots of ways, particularly that stuff, and it gets lots of gratification. And, and reasons why she, she loves doing the job is she sees the growth not only Simone, but also in the environment and resin in, in other areas she goes to. Okay. Um, look, we, we're getting lots of uh, sort of comments in the chat thread about how helpful this has been. Um, thank you, Sean and Alison. Um, I think that's been an incredibly um, interesting and detailed kind of um, exploration of the, the level of multi-layered intervention that has to happen, you know, when we're working with complexity and the kids are experiencing complexity that the intervention is often it's kind of it's complex but often I think um, I think it's really interesting that often the starting point is really simple might not be simple to do but the starting point is often about just creating consistency and routine and just creating some relational predictability um, and I think often people think oh yeah yeah do all that but do the magic stuff do the magic therapeutic stuff that will fix this kid with her huge problems um, and I think you're, this is a really great example of how you kind of have to start with the basics that do seem really simple and not enough and work from there. Okay, um, we're going to wind up now because it's 3.29. Um, so 
thank you everyone for your attention. Thanks for all your, you know, really interesting comments and questions in the chat thread. Um, really encourage people to have a look at the, you know, the website that's on the screen now. Um, Take Two has a, a e-newsletter that you can subscribe to and Jen Willis put that in the chat thread before. So if you're interested in that, go to the web page that's on the screen now. Um, thank you to everyone who's contributed to this conversation. Um, yeah, and we look forward to having more of these conversations with you um, as we all kind of come together collectively to work with these really vulnerable kids and families. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.